Well, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's MAR guest lecture. We're very fortunate to have Charlene Kennefy with us. I heard her speak on this topic uh, last fall at a local ARMA meeting, and I was so uh, uh, interested in the topic that uh, I asked her right away if uh, she would mind giving it to all of you and uh, so that we can have the recording to use for class, and she graciously agreed to do that. So this is our first opportunity. Uh, to get it together. So uh, Charlene is an Associate Director at Santa Fe Information and Records Management. And uh, I am going to uh, click on to the uh, first page of her presentation and allow her to say a little bit about herself and then get right into the uh, presentation. So Charlene, it's all yours. Uh, thank you all for inviting me. This is a, a great privilege. I'm very excited to speak to a School of Information Science. It's been a long time since I was at Simmons. Graduate School of Library and Information Science, and I did remember at preparing for this that one of my favorite classes at Simmons was a systems analysis class. And I guess that has stayed with me uh, quite a number of years because as the whole world turns around, I've come back to doing a whole lot more systems analysis. And that is uh, a lot of the continuation of what I'm working on now, in addition to my usual records management work, which involves everything from um, setting up a governance structure with the records attention schedules and standard operating procedures and directives and many other things that we work on day to day in a highly regulated industry. I also get to work cross-functionally and conduct lean events which allow the records management group to improve its own processes and work between groups, for example, between records and information management and IT or between records and information management, IT, and legal. And so a bit of what you'll see as we go through is some of the efforts that we've made at Santa Fe to improve the cross-functional processes that affect all of us in a large organization. And I appreciate the introduction and the fact that I am going to try to keep concentrating on my topic, so appreciate if you'll wait to the end, and we'll try to leave plenty of room to answer questions and um, continue forward. So let me just move on, unless I missed something, Pat, that you can tell me I need to cover. I am going to give you a, a list here of the kinds of activities that we use in our records and information management program that have responded to lean improvement methods. One of the motivations of moving towards the lean program at Santa Fe was the fact that we had so many mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, and other comings and goings of organizations that functioned in different ways. They had different finance systems, different procurement systems, different uh, records and information management systems, different IT systems. And as the companies came together and tried to figure out how we were going to all work together and standardize, uh, we worked on training people like myself in every department on lean improvement methods. And so, as you can see from this list, the, the thing that we started with was the harmonization of our program. When Santa Fe bought out the, program, the company that I was with, which was called Genzyme, we knew we were going to have to work very hard to get together and do things the same way, make some efficiencies, be able to operate the same way and cross-train. So we concentrated on the harmonization of programs. We decided one of the mo first things we work on is the contrast we had between a centralized records process and a decentralized one. And we wanted to make sure that as we onboarded and offboarded people at these companies, we did it the same way with the protection of information in mind. And certainly in a large pharmaceutical organization like ourselves, legal was a big part of our, our thinking. We have a lot of lawsuits, as you might expect. Anything that involves drugs is a, a highly litigious world. And any corporate world is a highly litigious world. We have disgruntled employees like everyone else. We have um, you know, slip and fall cases. We have all the things any large corporation would have, plus we have the added complexity of a very controlled environment in this regulatory world. So here are just some examples, and you'll see the slide again toward the end, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we were able to do some of this. But I just wanted to give you a picture of the types of activities that we concentrate on in our business analysis to decide what were the 
functions that needed this approach more than others. So I want to give everybody a quick history of lean. I imagine most of you aren't Six Sigma black belts or MBAs who might have been exposed to a lot of this. So if you are, I apologize. It may be a little elementary if that's the case. But I know I had a pretty good education and a lot of working life before I came to this. And there were a lot of these concepts that I had not yet been able to explore. So I'm hoping that you will be patient with me as I walk through a few of these. So we're going to go through a quick history of the lean movement uh, and what it is, why we worry about value and waste, what methods we use for process improvement, and then uh, finally, how do we actually do this in our own records and information management program? So this may be a bit small, um, but it is a chart of the development of continuous improvement and then how it evolved into lean, which is a subset of continuous improvement programs. And most of you are very young, I'm sure, but might remember that um, there was back in the darkness of technology, the Industrial Revolution, and then here in America, Ford started doing assembly line work. And when you start thinking about assembly line work, you start thinking, how can that go faster? How can we make fewer steps? How do we clean up this process so that we can make more cars in less time for more profit? So that was the beginning of all this, is basically the way Ford decided to do assembly plants. And over the years, this worked through heavy industry and heavy equipment into other areas like my own, which is the pharmaceutical industry and healthcare. And we went to the 50s where Edward Deming had the plan, do, check, act theory of how to follow your steps, how to make things work a little better as you, as you go through your own, um, your own version of the assembly line, I guess is how we want to think of this. And then the, the penultimate goal that Toyota re reached before lean was the Toyota production system. Toyota really put this into print. There were books written about how successful Toyota was. So that was um, Kiyichiro Toyota and Taiichi Ono. And they were looking at the Ford mass production system in order to create this Toyota production system. And many of you may know the concept of just in time, which is pretty much everywhere. Almost now with technology, with the internet, with the ability to telecommunications, we're able to move things very quickly as they're needed to other locations or something. Uh, overnight delivery via Amazon, uh, send it via a helicopter, send it via a drone very quickly just as you need something. And that was a, a unheard of back in the 50s, but someone decided, why do we have huge warehouses full of things where we can just order parts just as we need it and get it just in time to reduce the inventory and improve the flexibility of this, which would enable high labor efficiency while you maintain your product quality. So um, somewhere in the 90s, I forget which year, there was a, a book called The Machine That Changed the World. And that was when more Americans caught on to this concept and really spent a lot of time thinking about these lean principles. How to reduce this continuous improvement process to a set of principles that are easy to follow, don't require huge manuals to do this, and it began to spread across other manufacturing industries, certainly um, anything that was a lot of pieces like Boeing uh, in aerospace. And then eventually it worked into things like healthcare, where people who were in the services industry started to figure out there's ways we can produce services that mirror how manufacturing is done and improve quality control while eliminating steps and getting things to people faster. So around 2000, we started seeing lean principles in non-manufacturing environments. So Sanofi, my company, was not the first to adopt it. There are many others like Merck and Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson who were doing this not only in their manufacturing and supply chain parts, but also just in their regular business ventures. Uh, you know, finance or accounting or procurement, all of this is related to manufacturing. And when you see the way the principles work for manufacturing, brains take that leap and say, we can do that. We can figure the same way of approaching things to improve our processes in non-manufacturing environments. 
such as information management or, or uh, shared services of various types. My group is uh, records and information management or information records management. We are a subset of something called uh, facilities and records management, which is a subset of something called sanity business services. That's basically a shared service environment where all the services that make a business run that are not responsible for profit margins uh, are, are put, and we're supporting all of the businesses. And we find that many other corporations, and the people that have come into our continuous improvement program from other corporations have come from shared services environments, trying to apply a lean mindset to um, the business analysis, business process improvement sphere. So um, this is part of project management. Some of you may have taken a project management course. I know I, I've taken many. In fact, we'll probably add PMP to my initial set next year um, because it is yet another related way of looking at the world, project management. So we're looking at um, business process improvement through all of this manufacturing and non-manufacturing. And it's now spread through just about everything that we can imagine in the world. Even though they may not call it lean, a lot of these principles now are very similar. You've heard Six Sigma and Green Belts and uh, Black Belts and, and ISO 9000, all related ideas. So at Sanofi, we look at the lean mindset as a way to achieve more and more with less and less. And believe me, in every group, we're required to achieve more and more with less and less. That is just the corporate norm. Um, this is supposed to give us our delighted customers, another concept that comes from the MBA world. But we try very hard to make sure that what we do improves the lives of our fellow employees as well as any external or internal customers that we service. So we have um, a way to make things better, faster, and more profitable. Those are the three parts that we're looking for to improve. And if we move our delivery of our products or services to our customers that way, they're happier. We're happier. It could be less wasteful. It definitely would save money, and maybe it'll make us more money because we're getting things to our customers faster. We also really want the better part. In a company like mine, which manufactures pharmaceuticals, it, the customer focus is huge. Our patient focus is huge. And we produce everything from gold bond powder, which people don't necessarily rely on to, to save their lives, but we do have drugs that save people's lives. We have oncology drugs. The Genzyme part produces rare disease drugs. All of these require that everybody pay really, really close attention to what we produce, how we produce it, how we reach our customers, how they are interacting with our products. Very important to all of us. So the lean focus is on processes that customers will believe will add value in any industry. People will only pay you for what it is worth to them. You could produce any kind of a widget. You can have bells and whistles all over it. But if the customer doesn't want to pay for those bells and whistles, then you're just adding cost to a product that a customer is not willing to pay for. So one of the exercises that we use when we go through a lean event, such as the Kaizen, which we'll talk about shortly, is that we focus very closely on value-added activities, which are processes that change the product or service so that it meets the needs of the customers. And we want to increase those. That's what people will pay for, is the value-added activity. So if they won't pay for a pink pill and we're spending money making a pink pill, probably we don't need to worry about that because that's not value-add to our customer. Uh, a business-required non-value-added activity might be a process that customers may not associate with added value but are required by a regulation or law or business rules. For instance, FDA regulations or SOX compliance, transparency requirements are really, really important in my industry. And maybe the customer doesn't care, but those agencies and regulatory bodies can keep us from doing business and keep us from making a profit, can um, make us look bad in the world if we don't do things according to those rules. So there are times we need to concentrate on business-required non-value added. Customer doesn't care if it's a pink pill. 
that the FDA may require that our pill become pink to distinguish it from something else. And that would be uh, business required non-value added. They don't, customers don't want to pay for it, but the FDA might require it. So we can't necessarily eliminate those activities, the business required non-value added, but we can try to minimize the impact if we can simplify them and reduce the number of steps to them or just we either combine a couple steps and remain compliant with the regulatory requirements, then that's the best way to do that. So we try to simplify those. And then in terms of non-value added, that's what we call waste. Anything that's in a process that is non-value added, a process that requires time, money, and effort, for which the customer is unwilling to pay, is non-value added. So maybe I might like my pills pink, but if the FDA doesn't require it and the client doesn't want to pay for it and it costs extra money or adds extra steps, I want to eliminate those. It's very important in the process that we take a step back, take a look at what is in there as a step, and decide, is that really a value-added step? Is that business required? Or is that a step or a process that's non-value-added that we need to take out of there right now and eliminate? That is why we sit down and try to think about all of that. So we try to minimize that impact while remaining compliant, and that is a very, very important part of our work. So we're trying to generate value and eliminate anything that's not effective. And there are a number of ways we can measure that. So in our shared business services, we use these value creation metrics to ensure that we're continually improving the quality, speed, and cost of our processes. So we don't want to um, reduce our quality ever. We want to speed things up if we can, and we want to avoid any costs that we can avoid. So for the more profitable dimension of customer value, we've got cost avoidance, for instance, cost reduction, and revenue growth. Those are pretty important in terms of business survivability. We want to be competitive against our, our competitors. We want to provide the best value we can for our customers. So we need to concentrate on that cost avoidance, the cost reduction, the revenue growth. And when we do these exercises in our corporate environment, we also know that there are people watching us and looking at our metrics to determine that we actually have produced this type of value, the cost avoidance, cost reduction, revenue growth value. So we have that piece. We also have a better dimension of customer value, and that's the customer and employee satisfaction part and the compliance part. That is something that we consider a better piece of this value creation. And then for faster, we look into effort and turn on time. And that's where the steps are, are involved that we will analyze in our process. So what it means is that we as a company uh, can measure the success on different levels and that anyone working with leading principles in our organization can play a key role in driving success, which is what we're trying to do, we're trying to give everybody the ability to look within our company and offer improvements to any process. So they're not there intimately involved in it. We uh, are supposed to be open to all of these suggestions that come to improve a process. So um, we pay attention to these seven metrics, the cost avoidance, cost reduction, revenue growth, employee and customer satisfaction, compliance, effort, and turnaround time. And we're measured on those as a result of any of our efforts. So waste is a very important part of our lean activities. We want to identify any waste. We consider any non-value added activities as waste. So we've identified eight of these, these activities. Um, sometimes they're a little difficult to identify if we do it all the time, it's routine. We tend to accept that waste is a normal component of a process because we're not really analyzing it very closely every day. However, waste is present in all processes, and if we keep looking at it, there's more than once, the first step in eliminating waste is to learn to see it in the work we do every day. So really, leaders are trained to take a look at a process with our groups involved and try to look for these eight components of, um, of waste. And we use this acronym, Tim P. Wood, because it allows us to remember all eight of them like the seven dwarfs or anything else. You never remember all eight at the same time. So what we have here is um, the TIM is the P, transport, which is 
down the bottom left. And transport is the movement of work between areas or offices that does not add to the value of the product or services. So we are thinking that it's unnecessary movement. And this is very assembly line if you think about it. If you're moving things around that don't need to be moved around. If you've had to shift things from one side of a, of a, a manufacturing floor to another. Or if you're in the, in the record world, we keep having to move boxes because people are waiting for deliveries and we have to stick them in one file room and move them to another file room so someone doesn't pick them up. That's a waste of transport, a waste of time, energy, space, and many other things. But sometimes it just happens and you have to deal with that. But we try to eliminate that in any time we see it. The I in the 10P word is inventory, which is having more material or information on hand than is currently required. And again, that's a just-in-time thing. If you have more on hand than you need, you have to manage it. And managing takes time. It takes resources. The M part is motion. So is the unnecessary overly complex or repetitive motion of workers, is that something that we should be seeing? If you're walking to multiple locations to get work done, is that's not efficient. Um, so we're trying to make sure that motion of, of people, uh, which is independent of the transportation of, of objects, the motion of people is really a little bit, um, it, it loses up your resources. It may strain people. It may be an ergonomic incorrectness it may just take more time than it should if someone has to walk back and forth to carry one box at a time back and forth. So we look for ways to improve the, um, the motion of uh, people in the process or the goods. Now the people part, we don't like to think of people as waste and that is a very sensitive thing when we run our, our events is to make sure people don't think that the reason we're running a continuous improvement event is to eliminate the people <laughs> in the organization because everyone is overly sensitive about loss of jobs and that isn't why we're exploring these particular actions. We're already under-resourced in almost every area. We tend to run continuous improvement events in order to make better use of resources because there are so few. So with the people, it's really the waste of unused human talent. If you've got somebody that has good ideas and suggestions or can be part of participative management and so far they've either been silent or uh, no one's listened to them, that's a waste. And we try to make sure we bring that out in a group when we involve people in a, in a Kaizen event. So the, the W is the, um, the waiting part. We're just waiting around for the next step of the process. And that is very wasteful. As you can imagine, some of us are not very good at standing around twiddling their thumbs. And um, some people are really good at it. They just pull out their phones and keep busy. But if you have somebody sitting there looking at their phone instead of doing the next action in the process, that's a waste of a resource, the waiting part. Overprocessing is making more than is required or earlier than is required by customers. So we do not want to overproduce or, or uh, produce too soon. And defects, um, and excuse me, over, over, overprocessing is putting too much value to a product or service than they want or pay for. And we talked about that earlier when we talked about value added. It's really, really important that overprocessing is adding value. Uh, overproduction is adding more than is required or earlier than is required. And um, a lot of organizations are, are guilty of overproduction or overprocessing. The big one for most of us in my industry certainly is defects. And defects can be products or services that don't conform to customer needs, and that may result in rework. And as almost everybody knows, rework is a terrible thing. It's doing it over because something got forgotten, something was done wrong. We don't want to have defects at all. And in our industry, in, in uh, manufacturing, it is incredibly expensive to have defects. It is, um, there are many examples of how companies have gone out of business or had huge losses to their stock value or have even been bought out like, uh, I can go into details but I won't at this point, but companies have lost their ability to stand alone because of defects in their manufacturing and allow for takeover process to occur. So in general, we think about 5% of activities are actually adding value or adding activities that customers are willing to pay for. 
And so the challenge for any employee is to really pay attention to what is truly value added in their work and to focus on reducing or eliminating all the other ancillary activities that, um, that go along with that. And that's a tough one because most of us have invested a lot in our roles and our job duties. And it's very hard for us to give up something that we thought we did well or that we imagined somebody cared about. It's very hard to find out that someone may not care about something as much as you do or be willing to have you spend any time on it. I know it's tough when that happens to me, and it happens to me fairly often. So how do we improve our processes? There is a framework that's used in Lean, which is a process for improving processes called DEMAIC. And that stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. And so when we run an event that analyzes a process, we go through these steps. We start with Define and work our way through Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control, um, in which each phase is a step in this thought process of eliminating the waste and solving the problem of how to make it better. So if we use this structured methodology, Dominic ensures that problems are solved consistently so that from one analysis to another, we're using the same criteria, we're using the same tools to analyze that process to make sure that we have created this common language and dialogue for improvement. And we feel that way we can deliver maximum business impact through minimal effort across the organization. And so let's take a look at the MAIC, because that's one of my favorite parts of when I do an, uh, I, um, a session, is going into the define phase. And define phase includes setting a goal. So most of you have done project management, whether it was defined as such or not. And you know that there's almost no point in doing anything unless you want to say in advance what you're doing it for. You need to define that purpose and the scope of that and get all the background you might need before you analyze this process for the customer. So we do our best to understand customer requirements and what other processes might affect the outcome of our efforts. So if you come out of the defined phase, you should have a clear statement of the current problem. Uh, all your improvement goals should be able to be there and how you're going to measure it. Metrics are a really important part of the, this came out of manufacturing and follows that, that mindset, let's measure it. There's no point in doing it if we can't measure it properly because we have to be able to prove at the end of it that it was worth all this effort. So we start with a high level map of the process. We actually take a huge piece of paper on a wall and we start writing out what the process is step by step. And that helps us provide um, that context of the process for the business. And we also bring in what we call the voice of the customer. It's really important for us to talk to the customers, to find out what it is they want, what they'll pay for, and how they see this as a useful measure of success. So the defined phase tools include this project charter. And this is just an example of one we use in-house, which shows the, um, the various parts that include the people involved, the uh, the, the elements of this, we have our resources listed, we have our goal statements, primary metrics of success, so you know, are we eliminating 20 steps, are we doing this 10% faster, what are our metrics here, uh, what are the business, the business goals for this, what can we say is the business impact of it. And then because we usually use this charter as we, um, as this, this statement, uh, we usually show this as part of our outcome of our, of our, our work. And this aligns everybody right up front what our goal is, who's going to be responsible, uh, who's our executive sponsor, who is the process owner, um, who are the team members and what are their roles. And the charter helps us figure that out. So it's what the proven is to achieve, the scope of the activities involved, and what resources are available to you in one place. And we consider this a really important communication alignment and reference tool that the lean leader uses to work with the process owner and the executive sponsor as well as the people who are actually doing the work um, as we go forward and can check against as progress is being made. So it's a good problem statement, a business case. So we move on to the measure phase to collect more detailed data on how to validate the problem and improve or 
actually prove the charter because we find the charter is a starting point. But it may not be the exact same charter that we end up with. We may find during the course of the event that we've kind of realigned what our goals are. We've changed the scope slightly. We may find out we have the wrong, the wrong business sponsors and have to change those out. But that doesn't happen as often uh, as just shifting the goals slightly. So now we're in the measure phase. And so you've got the clarity on the scope and the goals in the defined phase. And then you focus on gathering information on the current situation. So you want to develop a current state map. And that is my huge piece of rolling white paper across a wall that shows me what the process looks like now. The people in the room that we've gathered together can each tell us what they do as part of that process, and we can draw it out. We can use colors and markers and charts and string and everything else to visually identify every step of the process, who's responsible, what is involved, and start taking a look at that. So we're not trying to fix it yet. We're just trying to set on what steps are right, right now being used. So we collect the process baseline data. We try to understand how the current process operates. And we then try to focus on identifying pain points. Pain points, waste, and customer value. We've talked about waste already. We haven't talked about pain points, but everybody knows what they are. There wouldn't be a continuous improvement effort if there weren't pain points that everybody already knows exist. But we try to make sure we identify all of them. And then we try to identify the value of that process and the improvements we're making to it. So this is a Visio um, you know, online software program to map out things. We, we put this in Visio. It doesn't look this neat when it's up on the wall, but we use a lot of these same colors and, and emblems to identify things as we, as we show our process problems. So in this one, we're, we're looking here um, just to the green, which generally starts things off. So green boxes are processing steps. Green is actually value. Green is something that's being done. And uh, it helps to visualize when you look across here, you see, okay, how much green is involved here? How many times is an action taken that's actually an action you ought to have? And you'll see there's a little uh, vaguely made red heart. This is a red heart, but whoever drew this, uh, not me, I hope, um, didn't do such a great job of a heart. But the heart shows that it's customer value added. And that's almost always on a processing step. Something that's in there is really important, and that's what the customer is paying for. So uh, you start by identifying all these process steps, whether or not they're value added, and then you color code them so you can visually look at this and, and take a quick look at things. Where's the value? Where's the waste? So the purple boxes, and there are a few of those here, probably because that's one of, in, in my world, inspection. Inspection steps are not really the steps you want to spend a whole lot of time doing. But they're required in industries like mine, you know, pharmaceuticals or banking. You need to have somebody constantly doing quality checks. And we try to reduce or combine those types of purple inspection steps along the way. Um, but you have to show at a current state map how many there are. There's a lot of inspections. And a lot of times that's what we can eliminate is a number of inspection steps along the way. So. Um, the yellow boxes are transporting steps. Not too many here, but there's always transporting steps where something is handed off between one group and another or one person and another. And or is just literally in the case of record management, maybe it's a, a records box that has to get from point A to point B before someone can take a look at it. Blue boxes are storage. So when you see blue, that means it's waiting for something to happen. You know, you're waiting for an email to be returned. You're waiting for the box to be delivered. You're waiting for something to happen. And that is wasted time. So every blue box is pretty much wasted time. So you're trying to identify defects and associated rework by connecting these process steps where the errors are. And you want to make sure that you notice those red lines. So that's when something is reworked. So in these, there's too much rework. You try to eliminate the number of times that something has to go back and be done again. And this is an inefficient process with this many red lines going back and forth and saying, 
um, next step, next step, uh-oh, got to go back and do it again. So this is just a visual. Um, I wish we could all be together and just put hands on because it's so much easier to understand when you get a chance to do this. But you try to then take a look at this and figure out how long it takes for the cycle time for each step so that you can identify bottlenecks in the process or steps where the, you have delays, where maybe the inventory isn't there and it delays the flow of goods and services or you're waiting for someone on vacation to make a decision and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. So that can all be written out in this current state. You can, uh, usually we put little um, numbers on the top of every box to indicate how long it takes, a day, two hours, a week. And then at the end we can add up the amount of time it takes for that entire process to go. And we can use them as a metric to say, we're reducing this time. It was 15 hours to step from step one to the step 30, and now it's only 12 hours, so we've saved ourselves three hours. And that's a metric we can use. So um, we're going to go into the analyze phase, and this is always a fun one in a, in a group. We try to identify the root causes of the problem. So we've identified some problems in our process, and then we try to confirm them with data. We try to go back to the process owner, or we look for a subject matter expert to say, what is the root cause? Why are we having a problem here? Why can't we move this thing along? And we end up with our cause and effect analysis, and a five lies approach helps us to do that. That's, um, yeah. So again, sorry for the eye chart here, but the, um, Many times we just see the symptoms of the problems, but we want to prevent the reoccurrence of the problems. So we drill down, we keep going down to identify what the root cause of the problem or the waste might be. So we use this tool called the five whys, and there's a lot of cool examples of this, but this is just one that was used to put in the chart. So if you want to ask the question why about five times, you will get an answer for a root cause. So here's one that starts that I didn't make my flight. And you say, why? Because I overslept. And you say, why? Because my alarm didn't go off. Why? Because the battery died. And why? Because I lost my charger. And then the last why is, you know, because I'm just not very good at this. I'm careless. I just lose things regularly. And you know what the root cause is. And you also know what the action can be, which is that you carry a spare charger. And many of these, if you read through them, you can identify yourself and your own weaknesses. And I've done these for myself, for my significant other, for my children, for things that go wrong on vacation. It's amazing how many times you can use the tree diagram of the five whys to um, realize how often you can screw up and how to fix it in the future. Um, but I wouldn't get too critical of your significant others because that doesn't go anywhere except trouble. Improve phase. And the improve phase is uh, the goal here is very clear. You want to identify, prioritize, and implement these solutions to address the root causes. You know that you don't have, you should carry a spare charger. So then you need to implement that solution. That's a really easy one, you know, buy a charger. But in the case of a complicated process, you might have to work a little harder at this. So. The improved phase is where you take your team and you develop this future state vision of the process and the solutions to address the root causes of the key problems and waste, don't forget the waste, that we talked about a few slides earlier in the analyze phase. So many of you have done this whole brainstorming, solutioning thing, I'm sure, in many parts of your lives or your working life or student life. And everyone always uses that phrase, uh, think outside the box or generate a whole wide variety of potential options, that, that brainstorming thing can be very valuable, especially if you have a room full of people who don't always work together, don't always have the same kind of job, and might see things a little differently when expressed by another person. So we try to do these brainstorming or benchmarking or experimentation techniques with a group of people from disparate backgrounds. So there may be more solutions that they come up with in a room of 15 people than you have resources to do or even a mandate to do. So you want to use a, a benefit-effort matrix potentially to, as a tool to prioritize your work. I don't do that. And I think most of you have seen this, the quick wins. We're in Kaizen, we're looking for quick wins. 
things that we can start and continue. We love to find out in, in the upper right quadrant a lot of strategic initiatives. That's great, but no one's paying us to get in this room and do this, do this effort um, because it's costly, takes a long time, and our charge is to do this quickly. Generally, it's 30, 60, 90 days. So let's get this done. Nice to haves are what we can implement after the quick wins are done. And defers are activities that we really, really want to just stop because there's no value add to those. So we don't want to pay a lot of attention to the lower right hand part of the quadrant because it's high effort and low benefit. So we want to make sure that our solutions are deployed. We want to document and train a new method. We want to implement, we want to use a control plan, and we use a change management plan. So we spent days in the room working on a solution, and we are coming up with an implementation plan, which has very clearly people, uh, the, 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 the task, the person to do it, the date that's expected to be done. So we come out of every one of these efforts with an implementation plan where it's very clear who's, who's in charge of which piece. And as a lean leader, what I generally do is I hold, after a three or five day Kaizen session where everybody works through all of these, then I call everybody into a meeting a week later, find out where we stand, see if there's anything that needs quick tweaking, and then say, okay, what's going to be done in 30 days? What's going to be done in 60 days? What's going to be done in 90 days? And then we have 30, 60, and 90 day meetings. At the end of 90 days, we should be done with what we said we would do. If it wasn't a 90-day solution, it needed to go into the strategic initiative and not in the quick wins. So this is just a small example of a very small Kaizen, which was on um, centralization of box storage between two groups that I work with. And it was very easy. You know, take things out of two separate systems, put everything in SharePoint. Um, have, have these very straightforward goals and due dates and keep track of the status. So we use those as one of the tools. So we want to make sure we have that change management plan in place because, as you know, the hardest thing to do is get everyone to accept a goal and to actually make the changes. It's great in a room with 15 people. You've come up with a great plan. You think you're going to make it work. You're sure you're going to make it work. And then you realize that everyone gets back to their desk and there are backed up emails and things should be done and other priorities. So we generally don't leave the room until we also have a change management plan so that we can make sure that we have a plan to deal with employee resistance and an effective management of the people side of change. So we think that the continuous improvement in lean mindset applies to everyone. There are um, a few big problems that we can fix, uh, project support and, and process mapping, project management, implementation control planning. And we deal with scorecard and, and dashboard development to make sure that we take care of those big problems. The medium-sized problems are these Kaizen events. So if we come out of, a, out of a meeting and we've identified all of these big plans, we've got more trouble than 30, 60, 90 days is going to let us deal with. But medium-sized problems, we use a Kaizen event, a two to four day workshop that's facilitated by the leader. And so we identify and implement a fix in 30 to 90 days. And then for small problems, one of the good things now is that we're at the point where when I see a problem in a process, I just can gather three people in a room and say, okay, what are we going to do about this little issue? Let's just fix it now. And we can, we can do this. It's very, very nice to uh, be able to make a quick change and not have to have a big, uh, big to-do with 15 people in the room from four different groups. You just pull together a smaller group. Here. Uh, and so I usually run Kaizen events. And Kaizen is an interesting, um, it, it's a lean workshop, usually three to five days. It's a, a potential vehicle for executing that domain methodology that's typically applied to these medium sized problems. And the medium sized problems in my organization are usually cross functional, they're not within one function. They usually require cooperation between more than one function to improve. And that's a do now solution. We are given authority to do this now, make a difference, make it happen. So we put seven to 15 people in a room. We um, bring everyone together and we work on transversal processes to cross these multiple functions, businesses and countries even. Afterwards, 
and I really enjoy doing these because I get to meet new people, I hear what they do for a living, I get to see what their part of the process is, and one of the things I enjoy, especially as an extrovert, is pulling people in that don't always get listened to or have a very small role in a process but an essential one, and that's why they're in the room. And other people need to understand what that person does and what the, um, what the obstacles can be or the challenges can be. And so we have actually uh, we put here some of the testimonials of people who participated because I like for folks like you to understand that people really get excited about these. This is uh, not just a kumbaya moment. People really enjoy learning more about how everyone else views their work and what roles they have and what pieces they provide for some of these processes. And that's usually about three days that it takes a team to gel. First day is kind of like the high school dance, with the boys on one side and the girls on the other. By the second or third day, that you know everything gets mixed up. Uh, a lean leader makes sure that people don't just get to sit next to the person they knew uh, before and who's their buddy. They, they have to integrate across the organization so that they know what, what we're doing. So we're, we work pretty hard at keeping the group small, uh, understanding those pain points uh, between them, having people in different groups be able to tell each other, well, the challenge is you think it goes like this, but what really happens is that. And just to see each other understand what happens to the other person. And it just opens their eyes and makes them a lot more interested in making it work across the organization. So we use that, we use the voice of the customer quite an awful lot um, ahead of time and during it. We use the current state value stream mapping to make those big charts on the wall. We list our pain points and we go back at the end and we try to make sure that we reduce the pain points. We look at a benefit effort matrix and that's often led us to other events or other things that we could do to improve in a department. Um, I did one, Kaizen, one time on the life cycle management of computers for onboarded employees and it ended up generating, I think, five other events because of all of the problems we identified and the other processes that were affected. We try to make sure that um, we concentrate on those quick wins. That we, we want to have an immediate effect. It's a good morale booster. It, it leads to efficiencies right away. We don't have to wait for that. It, it simplifies things, and maybe we haven't solved the big problem. If we solve a lot of smaller ones, we reduce the magnitude of the big problem that has to be solved eventually through a project or an application of larger resources. And then we create the future state value stream map, which shows everyone what our ideal state is, at least at this point. Reality is maybe there's not enough money or enough people to do it the perfect way. But we find a good enough way that's improved from the place before. And then we make sure to have an implementation and control plan in place to keep things moving forward. So here's just one example of a charter that we use for centralizing the off-site storage operations. And, you know, there are a number of people involved. We were able to make better use of resources. We were able to reduce risk for our organization. And I have to say that three years later, it's still going really well. And we had a follow-up event about a year ago to, um, to make it another improvement in the process because everyone had been so well cross-trained between our sites that we could make the next step. And it, it was good to reach that stage. And other, let's see what other things I threw in here. This is a, a small version of a, of a um, what we call it, a site talk chart, a supplier's input, process output customers to show where we're getting our input and who we're, who we're doing this for. Uh, for the customers, and we try to build these little maps at the beginning to understand the, an overview of the process. I think it's, just, it's, a, um, it's been used in, in total quality management programs since the late 80s, and it's still used in Six Sigma and lean manufacturing. So we try to use these as part of pre-work. Pre and lately, we do fewer and fewer three or five day events and more and more half day events or broken up events because we can't afford to constantly have 15 people travel between sites to um, spend three days in, in classrooms to get this done. But it is really nice to see that understanding that's developed by members of the team on, and how they let go of their own parochial viewpoints and see things through other eyes and, and offer some. So this is an example of one of my three-day Kaizen agendas where we start with the kickoff, go through 
voice of the customer and value stream. Next day we do root cause, we brainstorm, prioritize, design the future state, implement improvements on the third day, create change management plans, implementation and control plans. Then we do a little report out. Because usually we show people what we've done, you know, the, the um, leaders and executive sponsors. So that's, um, that's a destruction process value stream map, which I use now. We uh, actually donate Genzyme historical records to Harvard Business School for an archive, and I implemented this in order to not let our normal destruction process destroy boxes of materials that were of historical interest. So um, it's a pretty simple process, but it, it takes our destruction process and puts an overlay on it. And that was reached by bringing some people into a room. Because we get into our daily tasks, and we don't see all the minutia that, that affects it. And I think there's some, uh, yeah, back again. Some of the things that we spend time improving is our relationship with other groups, like, like litigation or facilities management. We do a lot of move, closure, renovations. You know, we close down big sites, manufacturing sites. There's a lot to do. We have to work between teams. Uh, we work with our global counterparts on things like records detention schedule updating. Uh, we have a records destruction process that's very important to our program. And we have things we still have to do, like work harder to improve our role in mergers and acquisitions and integrate our Canadian and American uh, and U.S. programs and reduce more off-site storage costs because right now they are getting higher and higher with less and less uh, resources to be able to apply to them. So I know that was fast and furious, and I want to make sure somebody can have a chance to speak besides me. So um, uh, if you have know. a question, you if can you raise your hand uh, or uh, type your question in the chat area if you don't have a mic. What does harmonization mean in this context? Rebecca wants to know. No problem. Well, um, we have a, a worldwide program in 80 countries. And one of the problems Sanofi has as a large organization is that we don't have a fundamental records management program that is consistent across all of our, our sites and countries. The U.S. has a mature program, but most countries do not. So what we're doing right now is we harmonize between our program and the global program in terms of policy, uh, emphasis on what we're going to get done, things like our records retention schedule, uh, the, the way we approach destruction, uh, many other pieces of a program. Harmonization can also mean that within the United States we have one part of the company that existed for 50 years and then a new part of a company is acquired like our animal health group. And they did things very differently. They have different suppliers, they handle off-site storage differently, they handle electronic records differently, and we are constantly trying to make sure that all of the records managers across these different parts of the country and the different sites do these things the same way. So we are able to justify and, um, and defend the way we approach records in our company. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask? How many of you have heard of the Lean uh, Kaizen approach before? Any of you? I'm seeing an Anika. Can you tell us in what context? And I see Charlene has put her uh, email uh, in the chat area. It's easier for you to grab that way if you'd like. Yes, I realize we don't have a lot of time left for everybody, and I just want to make sure you had a way to reach out and, and get me. Um, I probably should have even used my other one, but I just automatically <laughs> use the one that I know Either everybody one. <laughs> can get to rather than my work one. Great. Because, um, uh, but there I am for my other one as well. Either it's one. To grab from the oh, chat look, area. I did put it on the slide. I thought I hadn't for some unknown reason. 
And yes, I think lean is logical. It's just, yeah, it's, it's interesting. The um, lean is it's definitely a science. It's very funny that people come into it are not me. I am not necessarily linear. But boy, I really like lean. It makes logical sense. And I enjoy the part that brings everybody of these different talents and viewpoints together in a room and draws out the best in everybody to, to solve a problem. 